All right, well, <clears throat> as I've already told you, our text this morning is relatively brief, just one verse. Romans 15, verse 13. I thought this would be a good place to pause to try to draw together some of the lines of, of reasoning that uh, Paul has been giving to the Romans, and sometimes that's not easy to do because the way that Paul writes is not exactly straightforward. Sometimes it's hard to kind of figure out in, in the twists and turns of his, of his thoughts exactly where he's going. But um, I think, as I've said, this will help us tie together at least some of the themes that he's been dealing with in chapters 14 and 15. So, chapter 15, verse 13. Paul says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can see here, Paul desires that we have hope, and I'm hoping, by God's grace, that uh, we'll be able to draw encouragement from this text. Now, as you know, Paul's been encouraging us to love our weaker brethren, to use our freedom in Christ, not to criticize, not to stumble, but to serve each other. And last week he emphasized just how important this is because of the message that it sends to the world. If non-Christians look at us, if they look at the church and they see that we're divided and that we're fighting each other, that doesn't reflect very well on us, but it also doesn't reflect well on Christ. And we need to remember that we are what the world is judging Him by. Jesus wants us to reflect His image. He wants us to follow His example, and He wants us to reflect this to to everyone uh, in, in receiving okay, one another. That's Paul's emphasis in chapters 14 and 15. He says, I want you to receive one another in Christ, even though you do have differences. We need to receive all whom Jesus has received and accepted. We need to accept them. So that together, Paul says, we can speak with one voice. You know, have the same mind towards one another. We can speak with one voice to the world. We can show the world that Jesus actually makes a difference, that he does bring love, that he does bring peace. And he wants this so that he might draw his people to himself. Okay, that witness is very, very important. And, and again, we need to, to recognize that. But now, this morning, Paul prays that God would strengthen their hope. And what I want us to see, of course, is... Um, you know, the connection between what he's praying here and, and what has already come before. But as we look at this and as we see Paul's prayer, I think we need to recognize that Paul was praying when he was praying for the Roman believers. He didn't have just them in mind, but the church. This is what should be in the church in all ages, that the people of God would have hope. Hope that everything would be well for them in a world that would hate them, that would hate us, and the hope that one day we will be with him in heaven, because really hope strengthens everything that we do for him. Now, first of all, let's define hope before we get into this, okay, uh, that we understand exactly what we're talking about. Hope, we often interpret or we often define as something that is questionable, okay? Uh, we don't really know whether or not it's going to happen. We hope it will. Okay. We hope things that will, will work out well. We, we hope that we will make it to heaven. Uh, but that's not what this word actually means. It means knowing that God will keep the promises that he has made to us even though we haven't yet seen their fulfillment. Okay. It's not something that is in question, but something that hasn't happened yet that we're looking forward to. That, that is what hope is. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 24 and 25, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? You don't have to hope for it if you see it. But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. So hope is an expectation of something that we know is going to take place, and that is what Paul wants us to have. 
But before we look at this prayer, we should again note what it is that hope depends on, okay? It depends on a couple of things. It depends on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, of, of course. But it also depends, at least in part, on the evidence that we see within our lives. You know, as James says, you know, one person says he has faith, right? But show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Okay, faith is what gives us hope, but works is what shows us, gives us the hope that we have a saving faith, a faith that actually gives us the hope of receiving what it is that God has promised. Now, Paul just told us that how we treat each other can affect that hope that we have, genuine faith, that we have the hope of heaven. Remember what the psalmist had wrote about Jesus in verse 4 of chapter 15, how Jesus set aside his own pleasure in order to glorify his Father. And then Paul said this, that this was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And what Paul was meaning to say here is, is as we persevere in laying aside our freedom, our pleasure, our liberty, in order to minister to others in the same way that Jesus did, how he set aside the riches of heaven and came down, became the lowest of men and the servant of all and went through all that suffering in order that he might serve us and bring us to heaven. As we reflect more of Jesus' image in our own lives of setting aside what we want to do so that we can minister to others. God encourages us. He gives us hope through his word that heaven belongs to us. And we saw the same thing in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 in our meditation. Remember how Paul uh, talked about how we have peace with God through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and we exult in the hope of the glory of God because we've trusted him but then he goes on to say this, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So what Paul here is saying is simply this, that it's trusting in Jesus that gives us hope. We could never have heaven, the hope of heaven, without trusting in him, without faith in him. But the evidence that we have trusted him, persevering through tribulation, through the difficulties we have to face in life, proves our character. It shows us what we really are, that we are not stony ground hearers, whose faith vanishes when things get difficult, but we persevere through those trials. Seeing that our character has been proved through the heat of a trial strengthens our hope. It shows us that we really do have the Spirit's love in our hearts, the kind that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 never fails. Now last week, having quoted Isaiah, that there would come a time when the Gentiles, when we would place our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, now in our text, goes on to pray that God would strengthen this hope. And what I'd like to do is just consider three things, really two things from our text. First of all, that God is a God of hope. But secondly, he fills us with the fruits and evidences of faith so that we will be filled with hope. Now, again, we're not going to deal so much with the fact that, you know, trusting in Jesus gives us hope, but we need to see that that is the prerequisite of what we're looking at. But we want to focus on the character of God. This is a part of his glory, that he is a God who extends hope. We need to be thankful for that. But we do need to see how he fills us with hope in this text. So first of all, let's consider that our God is a God of hope. Now, sometimes when we read the Old Testament, I mean, we're reading through the book of Jeremiah right now, aren't we? Yeah, together. We can get an entirely different impression of God if we don't take the whole picture, if we don't see everything there is. Uh, 
And we see several examples of this in the Old Testament, and I think that unbelievers in particular like to capitalize on these things because sometimes it seems like God is rather harsh. I mean, after all, God did sentence Adam and Eve to death and cast them out of the garden. For what? Well, for disobeying him by eating the tree that he told them not to eat of. God destroyed the entire world with a flood, the ancient world. He devastated Egypt, remember, with the ten plagues, even killing the firstborn in every household in Egypt. Well, we've been looking in Jeremiah that God judges his own people, doesn't he? He threatened either to destroy them or to exile them to Babylon. Now, as I've said, unbelievers, you know, those who hate God, you know, such as Richard Dawkins, they, they look at these accounts of God and they see these things as grounds to accuse him not only of being unloving, but spiteful and hateful and capricious in his judgments. I mean, at one point, God seems to be kind, and in another, he's destroying whole groups of people. Well, we need to be careful that we don't fall into the snare of looking at God in that same way, that we never accuse him of being unjust or being impulsive, because we know not just by faith, but we know from reason that everything God does is right. Everything he does is good. Everything he does is just. We know that God condemned and cast Adam and Eve out of the garden because they rebelled against his infinite love and kindness. I mean, that was no small thing they did. And let's not forget, God did not execute judgment on them immediately, but he showed mercy. He destroyed the ancient world because they threatened to destroy his people and to thwart his plan. He destroyed Egypt because Pharaoh refused to let his people go, even though he told him many, many times. I mean, Pharaoh had 10 opportunities, 11. And Judah, because they abandoned him and they turned to other gods. When God did these things, he was simply being faithful to what he said he would do. He said that he would judge them if they did what is evil, and if they did not repent, if they didn't turn away from offending him and do the right thing. But what I want us to make sure that we don't miss is what else is included in, in each one of these judgments for sin. In each of them, God graciously held out hope. When he pronounced the judgment on Adam and Eve, let's not forget that he also promised to send the seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head. In other words, he promised he, would go, he was going to send someone from her line that would come into the world and undo everything that the devil had just done and that he would redeem them. Before he sent the flood to destroy the world, he made to Noah the promise that if he built the ark, that he and his family would be safe in the ark, which not only saved them from that flood, but was also a picture of the one who would keep them safe from the final judgment of God. Those who trust in Jesus are in the ark of safety when the flood of his judgments come on the last day. When he sent the ten plagues on Egypt, we know that God protected his own people. He freed them from slavery. And he did this that he might fulfill his promise to Abraham to give them a land that was flowing with milk and honey, which was a picture of the coming Redeemer, Moses being the picture of Jesus who leads his people out of this world to the promised land of heaven where we will be blessed forever. And of course, we know that when he brought judgment on Judah during the time of the exile, maybe I should ask you this question and tell me if you've been reading Jeremiah. What did he say to those who were willing to go into captivity? That you would be spared not only spared and provided for in Babylon, but you would be brought back into the land. And let's not forget the most important chapter, perhaps, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, where God promises to make a new covenant, where he would not only provide a redeemer, but that he would, through that redeemer, give them the power to obey so they wouldn't be in the situation that they were in in the first place, facing exile. In all of these situations, even though God was executing his wrath, he gave his people hope. Now, last week we saw that he gave us hope. Us, we Gentiles, right? He gave us hope. 
we were once separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, which meant we were without God, and Paul said, without hope in this world. The only thing we could look forward to as unconverted Gentiles, excluded from God's dealings with his people, was the everlasting judgment and wrath in, in hell. But God reached out to us in his mercy, and he extended hope to us. Paul said that that was prophesied in the Old Testament, that the Gentiles would place their hope in him, and that's exactly what has happened. God has given us hope because he is a God of hope. And so, Paul goes on to pray, since this is what God desires in his people, that he would fill us with certain things so that our, our hope would be strengthened, okay? And that would be the fruits and evidences of faith. Now, again, let's read verse 13. Now, may the God of hope, you know, the God who gives hope, this, this is his character, fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I mentioned earlier that Paul pointed to some of the objective evidences. Those are the, the things that, that can be seen outwardly, okay? The evidences of faith. Remember, that's what James is pointing to when he says, faith without works is dead. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works, okay? Faith produces works. Well, one of the things it produces is our setting aside our liberty, our freedom, things that we have, you know, the freedom to do in Christ, so as not to stumble, not to offend, not to criticize, but rather to love and serve our brothers and sisters as the Lord Jesus Christ did. He also pointed out perseverance through difficulties that cultivates a Christ-like character, okay? That also is an objective evidence that we belong to Him, that we have a saving faith. It confirms our faith is saving. And in doing that, strengthens our hope that we will inherit heaven. I hope you can see that we can't just say, you know, I've, I've trusted Jesus, therefore I know I'm going to be in heaven. That's not what the Bible says. I mean, if you have trusted Him, you will. But if you've trusted Him, there will also be these changes in your character, one of which is loving and serving the brethren. But here he points to some of the subjective evidence, the stuff that's going on inside of us. What is our experience? And he points to two in particular, joy and peace. Now, I thought that was interesting because, you know, Jonathan Edwards very heavily emphasized one affection in particular as being the main evidence that the Spirit has given us that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that evidence is love. Okay? Paul writes in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. It doesn't matter whether you've been circumcised as a man in the flesh or not but faith working through love, which is really talking about circumcision of the heart. It doesn't matter whether you have the sign in your flesh. What matters is whether you have the reality going on in your life, the kind of love that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 13. That is the evidence of a circumcised heart. That is, that is what makes faith alive. Faith works by love. And when you have this love of the Holy Spirit, it makes you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and it makes you follow Him in whatever He calls you and me to do. It is the spring, Edwards would say, the fountain from which all of our actions actually flow. So he emphasizes love. Now here Paul is emphasizing joy and, and peace. But we shouldn't be surprised because joy and peace are also fruits of the Spirit's work. Paul writes in Galatians 5, through 23, notice, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. 
And he goes on to list patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All these wonderful things. Against these things, he says, there is no law that forbids it because this is what the Spirit of God works in us. So it shouldn't surprise us that Paul would emphasize these, and it should surprise us even less when we understand what, how Edwards understood this verse that I just read, which is that all of these fruits of the Holy Spirit are really nothing other than expressions of the first fruit, which is love. He would say that we experience joy when we have the object of our love, when we have this relationship with God. You know, that's when we find joy because we find our joy in loving Him and being loved by Him. And this is also where we find peace, how we experience it, when we know that we are loved by Him and that all will be well. Well, Paul is praying that God would fill us with these fruits in believing, okay, in having trusted Jesus for our justification, that we would be filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit so that we would abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, so that we would have a full assurance that we actually do belong to God and that all that He has promised belongs to us. Okay, hope is very, very important. God wants us to have hope. He wants us to know that having trusted His Son, even though we are going to go through difficult times in this world as we serve Him, because what is the, what is the promise to those who live godly in Christ in the world, that you will suffer tribulation and difficulty. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. But He wants us to know that even though we go through these difficult times as we serve Him, we still will have the blessing of His love. God still loves us. We will have joy in our relationship with Him because nothing can separate us from Him. We will have peace in knowing that we belong to Him, and we will also have the assurance that God is going to work everything that we have to face in life together for our good. All the difficulties, all the struggles, all the trials, all the tribulations. We will have hope. We have hope that will sustain us through these difficulties. He also wants us to know that the heaven that He has promised to us in the Lord Jesus Christ belongs to us and that we will inherit it. Now that is what we're going to focus on this evening, or I should say that uh, Derek Thomas will focus on this evening because as we look at the world going south and as we see ourselves in a situation not, not unlike that of the first century Christians living in a, a very pagan and ungodly world, it's, it's helpful to know that we have hope that we have the hope of glory, that we are going to be with the Lord, and exactly what that hope is and what, what heaven is like. It, it's it's an, interesting, uh, an interesting discussion, explanation of heaven. I think he kind of goes at it from certain angles that, that I have, have not seen before. So assurance comes through faith. It comes through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of heaven. But the assurance that we have trusted Jesus comes from seeing the evidence, the evidence of faith, subjective evidence in our hearts, love, joy, and peace, and the objective evidence of that love working itself out in our lives by serving one another in the ways Paul's referred to, and of course by serving those outside the church, by offering them friendship, by loving them, by sharing Christ with them. And so, as Paul has prayed in our text this morning, may the Lord of hope grant to each of us that we would be filled with joy and peace and love, love for one another, joy and peace by His Holy Spirit, so that we may abound in hope. And may that be our prayer for one another in the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Well, let, let's spend just a couple of moments in silent prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us receive this word.